All right, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit, He, Vav, Zion, Het, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mem. Who would like to read verses 97 through 104 as our opening prayer? Sure. Okay. How I love your instruction. It is my meditation all day long. Your command makes me wiser than my enemies for it is always with me. I have more insight than all my teachers because your decrees are my meditation. I understand more than the elders because I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path to follow your word. I have not turned from your judgments, for you yourself have instructed me. How sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every false way. Amen. So therefore, I hate every false way. Kind of ties into our uh, chapter on sin to some degree, right? Uh, so tonight, taking a look at uh, the chapter on uh, sin. So chapter 24, and then uh, the covenants between God and, and man. Uh, we'll probably spend more time on the, the chapter over sin. And... Um, kind of give a, uh, a rough overview of the, the covenants and um, see where that, where that takes us. So regarding sin, I uh, often joke, um, you know, the, the idea of are you for it or again it. Um, we should all be against sin, right? But what is it? Uh, what is it that we're against? And one of the things that we tend to do is we tend to define sin as the things other people struggle with really bad. Um, and maybe the th we, we minimize the things that we might struggle with. Uh, and so sometimes we're easy to say, well, that's sin over there, uh, rather than being able to clearly identify it in our own heart, in our own life. So with sin, we need to um, come to an understanding of, of what it is. Uh, a couple other things that we need to uh, come to an understanding of is uh, where did it come from? Uh, and then as we move into chapters later on, we're going to talk about who, who it is that can overcome it. Uh, but talking about sin and, and what it is, is is really an important topic to delve into. Uh, if we don't rightly understand sin, uh, there there's probably some deficiency in our understanding even of who Christ is and what he's come to do. Uh, so that I think you can see if you go to, depending on like what churches you go to or what churches you might attend, how they emphasize what sin is, uh, you'll see then uh, kind of a reflection then of who they emphasize Christ to be. You'll kind of see that connection between their understanding of sin and their understanding of the Savior. So ponder that for, uh, for a bit uh, as, we, as we look at sin. So... Uh, what does Grudem say, or how does Grudem define sin, and do you agree with it? Or would you define it a different way? So he says, sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God and act attitude or nature. Okay. So failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. Okay, so some, some people may have an idea of sin that it's simply something we do, right? Have you, um, you know, like I've heard guys talk about, um, sorry, this just came to mind, but like guys talk about, well, it's okay to look as long as you don't touch, you know, like that kind of thing, which is saying then, so the sinful thing would be uh, the act, but not the desire, Grudem is saying that it's also the attitude as well as the nature or even desire, right? 
So do you guys agree with that? Or is, is sin just something that we do that comes to fruition? Or is it something that we even can think about, uh, even desire that's wrong? Can you think of any, like, scriptural proof to back that up? I'm sure Grudem gives some, right? Okay, so yeah. Yep. Yeah. So Matthew five, yep. Okay. If if you if you look and you lust, right? right? Saying you've already committed adultery in your heart. Okay, so yeah, and that's Jesus like pressing pressing the law into into the heart and helping people see that it's it's the heart uh, that's that's the issue, not just uh, the act itself. Okay? So Grudem takes a little bit of time and he um, unpacks a little bit of the idea of uh, just calling sin selfishness. Ha have any of you ever defined sin as just simply selfishness, self-centeredness? Certainly, certainly sin causes us to be self-centered, but is self-centeredness or selfishness the essence of sin? And, and Grudem would, would say that, although that's a popular definition, um, it, it still falls short because it's more about or we have to connect it somehow to God's moral law. Like sin is lawlessness. It's against God, against his nature, against his commands. So there's some lawlessness involved there or against God. So there's a moral lack of conformity. So to think of it as just selfishness um, probably tends to, um, well, think about it this way. Like um, even in the, the modern uh, sexual um, society that we, we live in at, in the moment, uh, th people make the case that, uh, you know, love is love. And so two guys uh, who sacrifice for one another um, and they aren't selfish, right? So they're, if sin is just selfishness, as long as I'm sacrificing for somebody else, then I'm doing okay, right? So if sin is just selfishness rather than being sacrificial, well, even people who are wrong are sacrificial at times, right? Um, so, so we have to be careful not to divorce sin from uh, God's commands or his moral law. Uh, that's the essence of sin is uh, contrary to or nonconformity to uh, God's moral law. And his moral law is what expresses his character. Okay. So the origin of sin. Um, it's not God. Uh, the devil didn't make us do it. Right. So we it seems like people may like to blame other people. Any of you here ever like to blame other people for stuff? Yeah, well, it's the only reason I did that is because so-and-so did that. If so-and-so wouldn't have done that, then uh, I would have been okay or whatever. Uh, so sometimes people like to blame God. Well, God's the one who created this whole thing. Or some people like to blame the devil, saying, well, the devil tempted me. The devil made me do it. Uh, but that's the origin of sin uh, comes right back to us, to humanity. Uh, I think Grudem does, a, I think this is a, a very uh, helpful way of, of thinking about the original sin, if you will, in the Garden of, of Eden. Uh, you take a look at um, basically page 622. 
when he talks about uh, the eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is in many ways uh, typical of sin in general. So kind of a general thing with sin. Here's what sin does. Okay, did you guys catch that when you read through there? Like what does sin first do? Okay, so first their sin struck at the basis for knowledge for it gave a different answer to the question, what is true? Okay, so that's what sin does. Causes us to uh, ask what is true and then instead of listening to what God says, uh, we listen to somebody else. And then second, their sin struck at the basis for moral standards for it gave the different answer or gave a different answer to the question, what is right? So God said, it's not right for you to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the devil said, well, really, God just knows that when you eat of it, you're going to become like him. And he's trying to hold out on you. Okay, so there's this wrestling with what is right. And then third, their sin gave a different answer to the question, who am I? Uh, the correct answer was that Adam and Eve were creatures of God, dependent on him, and always to be subordinate to him as their creator and Lord. Uh, but instead, they tried to be like God. Okay, so think about sin. Do you see, do you see that regarding sin in life? That it, it, um, it leads you to answer those questions incorrectly? Like, what is true, what is right, and who am I? So maybe something to think about as you're navigating uh, different things. And then he makes a, a final note there towards the bottom. He says, we should note that all sin is ultimately irrational. So what do you, what do you think Grudem means by all sin is ultimately irrational? Yeah, so it's irrational. It doesn't make sense, right? Um, as he goes on to say, it really did not make sense for Satan to rebel against God in the expectation of being able to exalt himself above God. And what are you thinking? You know, isn't that like, oh, it should be like a TV show. Like, what were you thinking? Right? Uh, there probably is one like that. Nor did it make sense for Adam and Eve to think that there could be any gain in disobeying the words of their creator. So he said, those are all foolish choices. And so when you think about sin, well, yeah, it's, it's kind of like the, the devil tries to make it look, or he tempts us, or the temptation is for us to see sin as something that makes sense in the moment. But it causes us to answer those questions incorrectly about what is true, uh, what is right, and who am I? So... So what's your, what's your take on that? Does, that? does that seem helpful? Or So do we like thinking of sin as being um, attitude as well as nature or desire? Or is that getting a little too close to home? Have you, ever, have you ever thought to yourself, well, at least I haven't? Or at least I don't? You know, like we, we talk about we, we're all, uh, like we all have our PhD in, in justification, you know? We're all able to justify what we do. Um, so again, that's a, it's kind of the nature of, of, of sin. So the origin of sin, it's not God. The devil didn't make us do it, although the devil was present there uh, tempting uh, Adam and Eve. But Adam and Eve chose, and they are responsible for uh, sin. Uh, the next thing he talks about is the doctrine of inherited sin. So inherited sin on page 623 
So how does the sin of Adam affect us? So we know what uh, Adam and Eve did in the garden, uh, but how does that affect us? Um, we didn't do that, right? Or did we? It depends on how you see things, right? Okay. So here's where we're going to take a look at uh, Romans chapter 5. So a little bit of uh, like, like setting up some categories, if you will. So Grudem, um, Grudem talks about it in terms of inherited. So in inherited sin, which involves both inherited corruption as well as inherited guilt. Uh, the terms that typically are used maybe in theological books or systematic theology is like original sin or original guilt. Uh, but he likes to use the term inherited. Um, now, not all uh, denominations or even those who would claim to be Christians uh, believe in inherited corruption. Most believe in inherited corruption. I think those that don't have kind of set themselves apart and maybe even are called into question whether they're orthodox or not. Uh, but not all would embrace inherited guilt. And so we're going to talk about some differences there. Um, I've read some different things, so now I'm, 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 I'm not exactly sure what Grudem um, all covered. I think he mentions, uh, I think he mentions Arminian, and I think he, did he mention uh, uh, Pelagians? Does that ring a bell from the chapter, Pelagians? Okay, well, if not, so here's your, here's your, your quick course on, uh, you have those who would call themselves Pelagians, and they would believe that everybody uh, is created without a sinful nature, and they're obviously no, no guilt. And then they're free to do what is right, free to obey God. Um, and so whatever corruption comes in is corruption that comes from the outside and works its way in. It's not from the inside out. Uh, then you would have semi-Pelagians, uh, or I guess Arminians would, most of them would fall under semi-Pelagian philosophy, and they would agree that there's inherited corruption, that we're all born with a sin nature. That gets passed on to us, that gets passed down. Uh, all, all of my kids were born with sin nature. Okay. But they would say that the guilt, we're not necessarily uh, inheriting Adam's guilt. Uh, if we do inherit Adam's guilt, then there's different ways of dealing with it. And that's why some churches would uh, push infant baptism. Because they would say you're born with a sin nature and you're born... Uh, under guilt, and so you need to be baptized as soon as possible in order to wash away that guilt, in order to combat that guilt. Uh, so you have churches that would embrace a, 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 a baptism for that. Uh, you have um, churches that deal with um, inherited corruption and inherited guilt in, in different ways, like a strong reformed or Calvinistic position would be uh, you have inherited corruption as well as inherited guilt. And um, therefore, you know, what's going to happen to what happens to infants uh, who die in infancy or even die via uh, miscarriage or such. Uh, and so you want to you want to narrow down what somebody believes about sin in a hurry. 
the question you ask is, what happens to babies when they die? Do they go to heaven? But then the question is, on the basis of what? Are they, do they have corrupt nature, but no guilt? Uh, ref a strong reform position is they have a corrupt nature as well as guilt. And so, apart from God's grace, stand condemned. And so then they have doctrines that say uh, all, um, I've read some that say all babies dying in infancy, which would include miscarriage and all of that, uh, God has ordained them to be the elect. You know, so like election is how they navigate um, the corruption and the guilt. Uh, you have another version of, of uh, inherited corruption uh, and then uh, a conditional guilt. Uh, like there's, there's guilt there, but it's conditional upon you embracing your sin nature at a particular age uh, or an awareness, not a particular age as in a number, but a particular spot in your life where you are, become aware of your sin nature and you endorse it. It's like you sign the check. Yep, that's me. Uh, so, curiosity, where, where are you guys at on some of that? Just to kind of stir some discussion um, if and we can we can talk a little bit more about the, the the inherited corruption and inherited guilt I think it's good to separate those two because I think it's a no-brainer to see that everybody is born with a uh, <laughs> with a, a corrupt nature or sin nature right you don't you don't need to teach babies to be selfish well, I mean Tanner might But they come out pretty much thinking about themselves, right? You know, I've never met a baby, you know, that's sitting there going, oh, my parents really need some sleep, so I'm going to hold off crying for a couple hours, right? They don't, they don't think that way. Uh, but anyway, so corruption, we agree on that. It's the guilt that we're wrestling with. So what happens... Um, you know, or the question is, are infants guilty before they commit actual sins? Do they, um, yeah, do they stand guilty before God? Just so you know, this is, uh, this, like, this is one of the areas of the Bible where I wish it would say more. But I know it's a very real, I, I, I can remember clearly, I was like driving down Highway 75, we had the 15 passenger van and kids hanging out the windows, you know. Um, I remember driving, I remember looking in the rear view mirror and seeing all of my kids lined up back there and, and thinking to myself, so... I, I know my salvation is secure in Christ, and but what if, yeah, like, what if a tire blows and I, I roll this thing and we all die? Um, what happens to my kiddos? Like, where where do they stand? How do they stand before God? So it's a very real question. So have you guys wrestled with that? And what have you come away with? Are our children innocent? Pretty quiet. I shall 
go to him, so he believed he would see him again. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I think that's one of those. There's always the phrase of the age of accountability. You know, so an infant, and I think there's that passage, and are they sinners? Yes. in heaven and I think the I think there is some level of accountability when that is I don't know but yeah where to answer that question is have they understood the gravity of their sin and their need for a savior and did they reject or receive okay so you would would you would you say that that is across the board for all infants or just infants of believing parents? I think I would say all. all. Okay. So Grudem Grudem makes the case that. Um, he said the, the general, now so here's, here's where I, I differ maybe a little bit with Grudem. So, uh, but he says the, the, the general, uh, the general tone or scripture or the general thrust of scripture is that, um, that, that children born into believing households, God, uh, like somehow it's, you know, if he looks at it as covenantal, looks at it as uh, the children of believers have a leg up on uh, the children of non-believers. What do you do with God not having partiality or distinction among Jew or Greek or your slave? Like somehow you're giving it partiality, but they're born into a Christian home versus a non-Christian. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. So does anybody? I've held, I've held to all infants being the elect of God. Okay. That's been my position, and I felt comfortable like saying, like if a baby has died, then they're with Christ, like in heaven. Um, I recognize that that's very tidy. It just seems like very tidy, and maybe the scriptures aren't always as tidy, but I, I, I wish that um, they said more as well. Yeah. That's where I've been. So I, I do agree with uh, uh, Grudem where he talks about on page 629 at the bottom. He said, uh, uh, here we must say that if such inf infants are saved, it cannot be their own merits or on the basis of their own righteousness or innocence but it must be entirely on the basis of Christ's redemptive work and regeneration by the work of the Holy Spirit within them. Uh, because there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So here's where, yeah, things get, get murky because our emotions get involved and uh, it goes then to show us uh, what it is that we really think, you know, about, about sin. Um, and how we see ourselves in Adam. Uh, did we participate in Adam's sin? Were we somehow part of Adam's sin? Like he was, um, Brudem talks about, uh, or theologians talk about, like the, the, the idea of a, a federal head or a natural head. And the federal head and the natural head actually tie into two other things that we've talked about recently creationism versus traducianism. Remember what those things mean? Uh, creationism is the idea that God creates each human soul and 
Um, so when a, when a child is born, God creates uh, a soul and gives them, them life. Traducianism is that body and soul is passed down from mom and dad. So, um, so anyway, yeah. Theology can get, I don't know, sometimes it feels like it gets in the weeds a little bit. Um, but the idea of um, babies being elect, that's, um, that's at least acknowledging right, that babies don't get to heaven on their own merit. Right? It's, not that, it's not that the babies were somehow deserving because they were righteous, or uh, it's not that somehow they at least didn't deserve hell because they were innocent, uh, but that it required in some way, the, the work of Christ in their life and call it election. Uh, but election there would be election uh, that also involves regeneration. Okay? Uh, it involves the idea of being born again. And even references like even John the Baptist uh, saying that, that he had the spirit even in his mother's womb. Right? So was he born again? You know, at an early age, that's not how God normally does things. So, anyway, some more of that. Yeah, how, does this, how does this all work together? How does this all fit? Uh, what happens today mostly is that people will um, start from the position of babies are so cute uh, and innocent there's no way God could send them to hell. And so it almost gets brought to the point where um, that somehow babies haven't done anything uh, to deserve punishment or separation from God, uh, hence or AKA they're innocent or even that somehow, um, yeah, at, least, at least innocent is how people would describe it. And so they get to heaven because of their innocence rather than because of Christ's work. So, so back to the idea of inherited um, corruption. I think we all agree on that, and, and that's an orthodox thing. Inherited guilt... Uh, different churches deal with that differently on uh, whether that's taking a position that all infants or all, um, all infants dying in infancy uh, are part of the elect. Uh, you know, that's, that's one position to take. Uh, another position to take uh, is, the, is the age of accountability or more of a... Um, What's the word? A conditional uh, guilt. Uh, so Millard Erickson takes takes that position. Um, so I'll, I'll quote him here in just a bit. But we'll take a, take a look at Romans at Romans five, uh, starting at verse twelve. Therefore, just as Sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even, though, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So there you see that continuity and discontinuity with with Jesus. Uh, but the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So 
So how is it? So this is uh, the, the case that Millard Erickson would make that there's a conditional guilt, um, meaning that uh, although we could rightly be considered guilty uh, as part of Adam's race, uh, that corruption as well as guilt being passed down, the guilt is uh, conditional. Uh, and he makes the case that just as we receive the, the gift of grace or the gift of life through Christ Jesus, uh, so in a sense, we also have to receive the guilt. And we do so when we endorse our sin nature by freely sinning. Now, I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, let me read a little bit from... Uh, he says, with this matter of guilt, however, well, back up. The current form of my understanding is as follows. We all were involved in Adam's sin and thus received both the corrupted nature that was his after the fall and the guilt and condemnation that attached to his sin. With this matter of guilt, however, just as with the imputation of Christ's righteousness, there must be some conscious and voluntary decision on our part. Until this is the case, there is only a conditional imputation of guilt. Thus, there is no condemnation until one reaches the age of, a, age of responsibility or accountability. If a child dies before he or she is capable of making genuine moral decisions, there is only innocence, and the child will experience the same type of future existence with the Lord as will those who have reached the age of moral responsibility and had their sins forgiven as a result of accepting the offer of salvation based upon Christ's atoning death. So he goes that way, and he talks about, he uses the word innocence, right? Right? But how is it that we uh, experience Christ's righteousness or the imputation of his righteousness to us? Um, does he force it upon us? Or do we receive it by faith? Okay, so he's... He's making, the, he's making the case then that what Paul is doing in, in Romans chapter 5 is saying that just as we must, in a sense, right, accept the imputation of Christ's righteousness, um, we must also accept the imputation of Adam's guiltiness. Now, that's the case he makes. So it's one of, those, one of those things, like depending on what position you're going to hold, if you're going to hold to an age of accountability, you have to work through some of those things and, and say, well, this is, this is how I understand inherited corruption or inherited guilt. Uh, is it conditional or unconditional? Uh, if it's unconditional guilt, then, then you're going to have to go the route more so of saying that, well... Um, Maybe all who die in infancy are elect, and God covers it somehow that way. Uh, or you can say, well, I think maybe it's um, conditional guilt. And so until uh, someone reaches that age of responsibility and chooses their sin nature and freely, volitionally, embraces that, that um, the guilt is only conditional and they haven't met the condition yet. So you can go that route. Do some traditions, so I'm thinking of like the, like the corruption that we've inherited that leads us to sin. And when we sin, then there's the guilt of like my actual sin that I commit. Do some traditions see like that the corruption is not what's punishable, but the guilt is what's punishable, but it's the corruption that leads to the guilt. And so then if the cross of Christ in some way 
cancels out the, the guilt, at least until I commit it, then there's nothing punishable. Right, nothing punishable. Yep. Yep. So those. Was maybe Wesleyans was reading about it or okay. maybe like some type of grace that cancels out the guilt up until I commit it. Yeah. So then another, uh, so yeah, not to short circuit that, but yeah, there's, there's different, different ways. So yeah, I don't, the, the, the corruption, but part of it is, 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 is the inherited part of it. Like, like yes, we all, uh, we all inherit a, a corrupted, sinful nature. Uh, and that will inevitably lead to sin. Um, now, at what point are you guilty of the actual sin you commit? But what Grudem would be talking about here, and I think even what uh, Erickson is talking about, is um, not only being uh, not only our own sin, but Adam's sin, the original sin. When when do we become accountable for being part of Adam's race? So it's not just actual sins that we commit, but our participation in the sin of Adam. So we inherit a corrupt nature from Adam, who sinned. Do we also inherit the guilt? And if so, how is that guilt dealt with? And in particular, we can say how that guilt's dealt with for everybody who can hear the gospel and respond to the gospel, right? The guilt is dealt through the blood of Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But what about babies who are miscarried, babies who are aborted, uh, children who die in infancy, uh, the, um, the, the disabled, who never reach a mental capacity in order to process these things? Um, what about them? And so that's, that's the question that we have to deal with as far as... And so uh, a lot hinges just here in Romans 5 um, and how we see that. Now, a couple of other things regarding sin that we have to be aware of where there's disagreement uh, in, uh, amongst Orthodox churches. Uh, it's the disagreement on what sin does to us or the, the nature of the inherited corruption. So that's another part of this whole discussion on sin. So how many of you have heard the term total depravity? Okay, so that's a good Calvinist term, right? Total depravity, the first, the first letter in the tulip, right? Total depravity. Uh, anybody know the other letters, what they stand for in tulip? Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Okay? So that's the tulip. That's a five-point Calvinist is what tulip. Um, now... Um, we, don't, we don't talk a whole lot about that. I mean, Grudem, Grudem would consider himself really a five-point Calvinist, and so we'll get through some of that. Um, but total depravity. Does total depravity mean um, that we are as sinful as we can be or could be? Or what does total depravity mean? I think it was one of the questions that was... I think I remember seeing it. Yeah, does total depravity or total inability mean that we are as bad as we can be? Uh, why or why not? But those are two different, two different concepts that we have to think about, total depravity and total inability. But total depravity doesn't mean that we're as sinful as we could be. Like, we could all get worse. You know, our, our sin could... Uh, blossom, but that's such a nice word to use for sin. Um, 
Total depravity just means that every part of our being has been tainted with sin in such a way that that's how we roll. Okay, we are inclined towards sin. We, we are in, we are in an incline and that's how we roll. When left to ourselves, we roll towards sin. Okay, that's total depravity. Total inability um, goes hand in hand with that, meaning that there's nothing we can do to right ourselves and move the other way. Total depravity means we're heading that way. Total inability means there's nothing we can do in ourselves to get ourselves up the other way. Okay, does that make sense? So some people don't like that. They say, man, what a depressing message. Like, how do you expect people to, like, engage in doing good and be excited about making a difference in the world if you tell them they're totally depraved and totally unable, unable of doing what is good? Why even try? Okay, so that's where some people, that's where, like, Pelagian, and I did find it here, that's... Um, question or point two on page 628 he talks about Pelagius a popular Christian teacher uh, back in 383 to 410 he taught that God holds man responsible only for those things that man is able to do so whatever God commanded man to do he's saying man must be able to do that so if God says love the Lord your God with all your heart, heart soul mind and strength well you must be able to do it so he said, total inability? Uh-uh. Total depravity? No. Whatever God commands us to do, he's given us the strength to do. Um, and so he, he went way that way. Uh, we would say, no, the Bible teaches very clearly total depravity and total inability. And what does that get us to do? That gets us to call out to God for help. Right? It gets us to humble ourselves before God. Uh, and then we are able to interact with things such as, uh, that's right, you are the vine, we are the branch. Uh, apart from you, we can do nothing. Uh, but in, in, in the proper context, I can do all things <laughs> through Christ who strengthens me. Right? So what are your thoughts regarding total depravity, total inability? Is it that bad? Have you guys ever been in a car wreck? Raise your hand if you've been in a car wreck. Right? Okay, was your car totaled? No, okay, so some, some cars can, you know, you just got a little ding here or there. In other cars, uh, you, have to, you have to haul them away. And the insurance guy comes out and says, totaled. Uh, or not drivable. It's done. It's totaled. Does that mean the car is as bad as it could possibly be? No. Um, so even in our situation, total depravity doesn't mean that we're necessarily as bad as we could be. But we are totaled. <laughs> right? Every part of us is inclined towards sin. Now, that's apart from Christ. Uh, Christ gives us with the Spirit of God. And so then, it's only through the Spirit of God that we are able to move the other way. But we don't do it on our own. What about degrees of sin? Or before I go there, where... Where are you guys at with questions and about what we've talked about so far? I feel like maybe the conversation is maybe a little disjointed. And I apologize. I'm a little disjointed. So. Grace? That, what is that? 
right? Or are to to do something to do something right? We're not necessarily necessarily saying that all we ever do is evil and harmful, but we're doing it for ourselves. We're not doing it for God. So yeah, I, I know I know unbelievers who are, you know, what's the word, philanthropists, and you know, give lots of money to humanitarian efforts, and um, why are they doing that? You know, so it's it's possible to do things that produce a measure of good. Right. So it falls short of the glory of God. Right. So they're not doing it for God, they're doing it for themselves. Yeah. That's a good call, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, the, the, the heart of the matter. How does that play into it? So again, so when I say totally depraved, it doesn't mean that a, an unbelieving dad can't treat his kids with a measure of goodness. I've, I know some who are, you know, generally good dads and want good for their kids. But it's not about God. It's not about God's glory. It's, it's in their own strength and for their own purposes or ends. And so, yeah, sin, sin doesn't have to be always uh, murderous in order to be sin, right? Uh, even think about the Tower of Babel. Uh, I mean, they're building a big old city. They're taking care of lots of people. You could say that was a great humanitarian effort. What were they doing? They were building, building something to make a name for themselves, uh, rebelling against God. Uh, degrees of sin. Sorry, maybe was there was there more to that? No. Okay. Uh, degrees of of sin. Uh, he talks about uh, legal guilt, so he, he talks about it in terms of, you can say, well, we'll all sin. Now, how many of you have heard this? Sin is sin. And we've all sinned, sin is sin. Okay? Well, legally speaking, you could make the case that, yes, if uh, you, you falter at one point, James says, James 4.10. So if you break the law at one point, you break the whole law. Sin is sin. Um, but yet... Um, he also talks about results uh, in the life and relationship with God that, that not all sin is sin, right? Or not all sin is equal. Not all sin carries the same consequences. You know, like there's, there's a difference between, um, you know, coming to church and stealing a pen and cheating on your wife. Right? Can have greater, greater immediate consequences, and so even even the Bible talks about. Uh, he's got several spots down here. It talks about greater sin, um, greater abominations. So, and it's on page six. Th 34 that he gives kind of the application there. The distinction that scripture makes in degrees of sin does have positive value. First, it helps, to, helps us to know where we should put more effort in our attempts to grow in holiness. Second, it helps us decide when we should simply overlook a minor fault in a friend or family member. Third, it may help us decide when church discipline is appropriate. Fourth, this distinction may also help us realize that there are some basis for civil governments to have laws and penalties prohibiting certain kinds of wrongdoing such as murder or stealing, unless it's a church pen. I've always wanted to put on our church pens, stolen from Faith Baptist, please return Sunday at 9.30 a.m. I don't know if people think that's funny or not, but... 
and then just hand them out in town. <laughs> and so maybe the question comes up, what happens when a Christian sins? Uh, he says, well, our legal standing before God is unchanged, but our fellowship with God is disrupted and our Christian life is damaged. Um, so I've always thought about this, like the difference between having peace with God and having the peace of God. And so maybe that's a distinction that you've heard before. Uh, Romans 5 talks about, therefore, since we're justified, we have peace with God, meaning that our relationship with him is secure. But then in other places like Philippians, it talks about uh, not being anxious and, and, and praying and seeking God and the peace of God that surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Well, if we're sinning and grieving the Holy Spirit, uh, you're going to be uh, messing with some of that uh, peace that you have uh, with God. Uh, the peace of God that you have, not necessarily, uh, well, not necessarily, not the legal standing that you have with God as his child. Man, I told you there was a lot in here. Have any of you ever worried that you may have committed the uh, unpardonable sin? Has that ever been an issue for you where you read about the unpardonable sin and you thought, oh, I think I've done it? Or met anybody? Man, excuse me. I feel like I have something in my teeth, but I don't like picking my teeth in front of everybody. Anybody on that one? The unpardonable sin? If somebody says, well, Pastor, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. How would you respond if somebody came to you and said, I really think I committed the unpardonable sin? How would you have that conversation? I'd ask him what it was. Yeah. <laughs> well, what'd you do? What'd you do? <laughs> Give me the details. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> so the unpardonable sin is mentioned uh, in Matthew. Uh, Grudem Grudem goes through that quite extensively uh, as far as as dealing with it. He talks about uh, four different possibilities of what it could be. Uh, The fourth one is the one that um, he would hold to, that uh, this sin consists of unusually malicious, willful rejection and slander against the Holy Spirit's work, attesting to Christ and attributing that work to Satan. And so then he goes through and he works through that passage in order to show you how he arrived at that. Uh, one of the things that he uh, says that's, that's helpful which I see must be on this page. Oh, on uh, page 640, he says the, the fact that the unpardonable sin involves such extreme hardness of heart and lack of repentance indicates that those who fear they have committed it uh, yet still have sorrow, um, fear they've committed it yet still have sorrow for sin in their heart and desire to seek after God do not fall in the category of those who are guilty of it. So in other words, he says, well, if you've worried you committed it, you haven't. Like, if you've committed it, you wouldn't care at all about it. We'll do a couple things regarding covenants. Um, But before we do that, just one question regarding... Um, regarding sin. Uh, it's question 15 in, the, in your workbook. And it, kind of, it follows with that, but I'll just read that one. What, what are ways you tend to minimize, excuse, or rationalize your sin or blame your sin on others? And maybe this is kind of a, a question that goes with it. Uh, 
Do you think that you individually uh, hate sin like you should? Uh, do you think that we, or whatever church you're involved in, that we as a church uh, stand against sin like we should? Do we talk about sin enough? I'm just curious. I'm, I don't necessarily have, have an answer. I would, I would hope that we cover sin appropriately as we cover and point people to Jesus, right? So it seems like some of the, some of the movement or uh, Christianity today is in, involved, and again, this goes back to how we view sin, um, will in a, in a large way determine uh, who we desire Christ to be. Okay, so like if we, if we view sin as uh, us falling short of our potential, then we'll view Christ more as a coach, encourager, equipper, helper in that way, but not so much savior, right? Uh, if, if we view sin as, um, yeah, and sometimes we don't even, like, we don't even want to talk about, or churches don't want to talk about sin anymore, and it's all about, we, we view sin as us not being happy, maybe. And so then we'll view Christ as not so much Savior and Lord, but uh, maybe even therapist, uh, again, encourager. Um, but in those situations, though, the whole, like, you're not going to get too caught up in, in a, a bloody crucifixion and atonement and propitiation and all of that because, hey, I just want to be happy, you know, and, and, and sin is me not being happy like I should be. It's not about me not conforming to God's moral law and deserving punishment and wrath. If, it, if it's that, then the good news of great joy is that Jesus is born and he's the Savior who's Christ the Lord, that uh, he is the propitiation for our sins. Like, so you see how those two are connected? So it'd be always kind of an interesting thing to, to ponder. Um, for example, when you hear um, gospel, what, what would be called a gospel presentation, is the gospel presentation, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? But for what? Why? Why do we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Because the wages of sin is death. Right? We are attached to Adam. There is corruption and guilt that has come our way, and we're deserving of sin and death. It's not all Adam's fault. We embrace it as well. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? If I just get up in front of a group of people and say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, have I preached the gospel? If I say, uh, oh, your life is so broken, Believe on the Lord Jesus. He's going to put all the pieces back together. Have I preached the gospel? All right. So, so this moves into, in a sense, right, the, the next chapter, the covenants between God and man. Yes. I 
say corporately, yes, and in our curriculums, and but I have like conversations where it seems weighted, like original sin and justification, like coming to Christ is very weighty, gets discussed, urgency even. But it's like the transforming to become like Jesus Christ and how we, we still struggle with sin as we are being sanctified. That seems to get like, it's not as important. Hmm. Like, like it gets excused. I can totally see why you would do that. Or like, you don't have to worry about that. I do that too. Or, um, and that's not just like, that's not me teaching anything or hearing anything from the whole. That's just very conversational. And then I'm always struck with the feeling of like, how do, how do I interact with that? Because some some people are not receptive, like they're comfortable in not owning it, or they're comfortable in um, like it's not that bad, you know, like giving it levels. And, and some people just maybe just don't even know what the Bible has to say about that. Um, and so that's where I think, I guess that's where I would come back to, you know, we're all theologians. And how much do we even know of the scripture to be able to be exhorting each other in conversation, not corporately? Um, I don't know what kind of grade that is on our church, but that's, I guess that's just answering your question of where I have found. And that just might be really common. So that's where I think we are, at least from the women's groups. I'm going to speak from like talking to other women. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's insightful. So, in, in terms of. Um, like, I'm, I, I, I am saved from sin, so the justification, you say we're fairly strong there. But when we move to, I am being saved from sin, the sanctification, maybe we, we've took, the, took our foot off the gas or whatever, or we don't take that as seriously. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that I ever catch that in, like when I teach a lesson, it's there. When I hear it from the pulpit, it's there, like corporately, but I feel like interpersonally, where you can actually have the the conversation and like the teasing out of it and it just it it's excused way faster and it, it maybe because it's uncomfortable or maybe because we don't know what to do with it or where to go with that I don't know yeah yeah so it's 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 kind of like it's it's easier to say well I know Jesus died for my sin past present future my sin is covered and someday I'll be, I'll be completely set free. Uh, I'm in the messy middle, and I'm not quite sure what to do. And so are you, and so let's just keep on being in the mess. Right. Yeah, let's just, let's just enjoy the mess together. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's good. That's helpful. Yep, thought-provoking. So yeah, we'll get into some of that too as we move into the, the work of Christ. Uh, the covenants uh, between God and man. Uh, the big idea is, uh, he defines covenant as an unchangeable, divinely imposed legal agreement between God and man that stipulates the conditions of their relationship. Uh, Grudem himself would be covenantal in his understanding of the Bible, and, and so he would see the Bible as being governed by covenants and um, so a, a quick lesson on covenantal theology. Uh, there's three major covenants that he would point to. Uh, the covenant of works, which took place in the garden, and that was between God and Adam and Eve. Um, the stipulation was don't, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and the, the, the punishment, should they not meet that stipulation, was death. Okay, so we know that Adam and Eve um, didn't, didn't keep that. Uh, that that was, uh, in, in a sense, broke. Uh, and then in Genesis three fifteen, 
uh, we get a glimpse of what, uh, what he would say is the, the beginning of the, the covenant of grace, uh, where he talks about uh, the, the seed of the woman that's going to bruise the serpent's head. And the covenant of grace is this overarching covenant that all the other covenants kind of fall under. Uh, the covenant of grace would include the Noahic covenant. It would include the uh, Abrahamic covenant. Uh, it would include the uh, Mosaic covenant or the old covenant as, as it's referred to. Or it would also include the Davidic covenant. And then ultimately would also include the new covenant. Uh, and so they, they, they view that all as this overarching covenant of, of grace and these other covenants underneath there with the, um, this last covenant, final one, being the, the new covenant, uh, which is through Christ and his blood. Uh, the other covenant that they talk about is the covenant of redemption. And they, um, and they, and they use the language covenant. Um, just saying that before the foundation of the world, that within the Godhead, they covenanted to uh, provide salvation. Uh, so there was this, in a sense, for, for lack of a better way to describe it, an agreement um, within the Godhead that the Father would send the Son, and the Son would do the work of redemption, and then they would send the Spirit, and the Spirit would apply that redemption, and uh, thus you would have the people of God. Uh, so that's a, like a very, very primary, or what's the word I'm looking for? A very uh, <laughs> simple uh, overview of basic covenant theology. Now, what, what, he, um, uh, what he does... At the end of this chapter, uh, he talks about uh, the relationship between the covenants. Now, typically, people uh, fall in one of two categories. Um, what's the other category besides covenant theology? Dispensationalism, right? So dispensationalism, he uh, just describes that uh, briefly uh, here in the, in the last bit of the chapter. It says, by contrast, dispensationalism emphasizes discontinuity between the ways God related to people during periods of history or dispensations. And he highlights seven, uh, the, the typical seven dispensations, uh, innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and then the millennial kingdom. Now he also adds at the end a paragraph saying, recently a third alternative called progressive covenantalism has gained influence. Uh, this view holds that the Old Testament includes five different covenants with creation uh, and renewed with Noah, Abraham, Israel, and David, and that these covenants are fulfilled in Christ. It also holds that covenants in the Bible are both conditional in one sense. They require a faithful covenant keeper who is ultimately Christ and unconditional. In another sense, God will accomplish his purposes. There you go. Now you know it all. <laughs> <laughs> or you should have all kinds of questions uh, about that. Um, so I have, I have, I have never, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so those who hold to covenant theology, that's typically a reformed, um, reformed Presbyterian, uh, very much covenant theologians, uh, Reformed Baptists also in that camp. Uh, I definitely lean towards covenant theology. Uh, doesn't mean that those who hold to covenant theology uh, don't recognize that there are different dispensations uh, made yeah, differ on how we define them or how we see them. But yes, there are, are different 
uh, eras and, and how God has worked differently. Like, yes, of course, we see that. And even, even dispensationalists, they don't say, oh, there's no such thing as covenants. Well, that's ridiculous. Of course there are. Uh, the Bible talks about them. And so they incorporate the covenants in, within their dispensational theology. But the dispensations are the structure uh, that they stick the covenants in. And, um, and, and so dispensationalism generally... Uh, emphasizes more the discontinuity between the Old Testament and the New, whereas covenant theology tends to emphasize the continuity between the Old Testament and the New. Now, where I find myself as sometimes feeling like I don't really fit in either spot, um, I think progressive covenantalism uh, provides maybe some avenue there. So uh, that's, and just, yeah, don't mistake progressive covenantalism as covenantalism for progressives, okay? That's not what we're talking about, but progressive covenantalism in the sense that uh, the way I've heard uh, one of them explain it is that you take Genesis 3.15 and, and each covenant is kind of an unfolding of, of God's plan uh, to have the seed of the woman uh, yeah, essentially be uh, yeah, the, the king and overcome sin and establish his kingdom. So again, that is a very cursory, uh, simple overview. There's a couple minutes left, so what do you guys, where do you guys want to go? Um, there are some good podcasts, Stephen or Stephen. So Stephen as S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Uh, I think he pronounces it Stephen Wellum, uh, W-E-L-L-U-M. Uh, he's a professor at Southern Seminary. Um, you, you have the abridged. Do you have the abridged yeah. book on progressive covenantalism? What's that called? Kingdom Through Covenant. Okay. And then he's got, yeah, I have the big one. I haven't worked my way. I've only worked my way through parts of it. Um, I do have another smaller book, too. I'd have to, I have to look, and it addresses just some of the issues of progressive covenantalism, but it's not the same as the one you have. Um, There's a podcast called Christ Over All yeah. that he does, and they did a whole series on it that was helpful. I listened to some of that on Saturday. Christ overall. Thank you. So, yeah, the the thing I struggle with with just the 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 those three categories, the um, covenant of works, covenant of grace, covenant of redemption is the, the covenant of grace in which um, all those different covenants kind of line up underneath there. Uh, it doesn't seem as if maybe they give the new covenant the um, a, a, a unique a spot as it should have in in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and so, and maybe what I'm saying is that um, I, would, I would see more discontinuity with, between the Old Testament and the New Testament than some covenant theologians do. But I don't see as much discontinuity as most dispensationalists do. So that's the... Um, that's the rub. Well, we are uh, out of time. So let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this time. 
I pray that you'd grow us in the grace and knowledge of you, Lord Jesus. Help us to help us to think of sin rightly. Uh, yeah, as we walk with you, teach us to love what you love and teach us to uh, loathe what you loathe. We recognize that it's only through you, Lord Jesus, that we are able to uh, come to the Father and um, or it's through the, the covenant that you have established in your blood through your, your death, burial, and resurrection. And, and so we, we recognize that and acknowledge that tonight and pray all these things in your name. Amen.